Um, well, welcome one and all to University of Plymouth for tonight's event. Um, my name is Bob Fern. I'm Associate Dean Research and I'm here to represent the university and welcome you all and do a very brief introduction. Um, so tonight we're here for the inaugural professorial lecture of Mona Nasser. So becoming a professor is actually a very significant event in an academic's career. It's the highest level of academic standing, which basically means you've been recognized as an international authority within your field. So congratulations to Mona for achieving that. Well done. So one of the things that a professor must do is profess, which means that, they are, uh, that Mona is going to talk to you about what it is that has made her an international expert. The challenge for Mona this evening is to give a presentation that will be acceptable to the experts in the field who are in the room here tonight and the general audience who are just really interested in what it is that Mona has to talk about and I'm sure she will enlighten us all. So this, this is a tag team introduction and, and Michael will in a minute do a more personal introduction to Mona's talk. But I just wanted to share one recollection from my own inaugural lecture many years ago now. I was on that occasion very nervous. My family and my PhD supervisor came down. A lot of friends were present. Um, I had practiced and practiced my inaugural lecture so that I knew the timing perfectly. and It was going to work like clockwork. And I was waiting at the start when my then dean came in to do exactly what I'm doing now. Um, but he was not a prepossessing sight, I have to say. He was wearing a green anorak, slightly red from the rain. And as I remember it, he approached me and muttered into my ear, I've got a train to catch, so keep it down to 40 minutes. <laughs> then he left me to my own devices. But that is not the environment here tonight, Mona. This is a welcoming, friendly environment, and we're all looking forward to your talk. That being said, Okay, thank you. Well, good evening and welcome to this inaugural professorial lecture by Mona Nasser. It's a real privilege to be asked to make this introduction because inaugural lectures are part of the rituals of universities, as we just heard. And for all their levity, and sometimes levity anyway, they serve to remind us that whatever else it does, the university, the function and purpose of a university is as a repository of knowledge and as an instrument of inquiry. Universities are essential to the 400 year old project begun in the Enlightenment to know the world and to use our intelligence to alleviate the hardship of not only just humankind, but all sentient beings. And it's worth reaffirming what's just been said, that Mona has been awarded the title of professor on the basis of her, of her amazing research, which contributes to this human-centered ambition. She will no doubt have something to say about that, but before she does, I've been asked to introduce her with a personal anecdote. Now, I don't know when, I, when Mona first got to Plymouth, I know it was quite some time after me, but I feel she's always been around, since I can't really remember a time when she wasn't somewhere in the periphery of my vision, doing something interesting that was worth looking at. If I remember rightly, uh, we first got to work together closely on the Cognovo project. This was an amazing transdisciplinary project, research project, of which the university is rightly proud. The project was led by Professor Sue Denham, who is here this evening. Welcome, Sue. <clears throat> and through a Marie Curie ITN using EU funding, 25 PhDs researchers were awarded bursaries. Its topic was cognitive innovation. And what was unique about the program was that researchers came from across the university. And if, if I can remember rightly, they came from the hard sciences, such as experiment, ex experimental neuroscience, computation, maths, robotics. 
psychology, as well as music, the arts, and various disciplines in the humanities, including philosophy, history, and film studies. In addition to the faculty, it had a host of international external advisors, and alongside the supervisory team, there were probably more than 100, 150 international specialists working with these 25 students, thinking about what it means to be creative, and more importantly, thinking about what it means to work with people from other disciplines which have different priorities, different values, and different worldviews. And it was here, I think, that Mona was most visibly present and absolutely in her element. She seemed impervious to the academic tensions and able to flow quite seamlessly between people who in the course of their normal working life were not used to meeting with each other and let alone dealing with the technicalities and specific language of disciplines that were alien. It's certainly where I came to know her more fully and recognise her talent for engaging with people. <laughs> Looking at her CV, she has formidable titles. Director of Plymouth Institute of Health uh, and Care Research, Professor of Clinical Epidemiology, Quest Visiting Fellow, NIHR Oral De and so on. It goes on, you can all read this elsewhere. These seem to be enough in themselves, but outside this, away from academia, I discovered while we were doing the Cognivo project that not only has Mona done everything I vaguely tried to do, but she's got diplomas and licenses and medals and certificates and degrees for it. Whereas all I'd managed to do was really skirt around the edges like some helpless dilettante. So, for example, she can play the piano, whereas for a brief period I just desperately blew into a saxophone and eventually gave up before I was lynched by the neighbours. I discovered that she does various special forms of dance, calligraphy, yoga, rock climbing, while all the time functioning as an amazing academic sitting on international committees, that contribute to the form and direction of clinical research and dental research in particular. She, ma <coughs> she managed to write papers and at the same time to paint and draw and learn marquetry. The list is ever expanding, astrophysics, space exploration. I don't have time to go through. But what I'm most grateful for, uh, Mona, is that it turned out that we both shared an interest in flying light aircraft. I'd started training about 10 years ago at Plymouth Airport, and when it closed, other things got in the way, and I sort of forgot about it until quite by accident I discovered that Mona was flying out of Exeter Airport with my old instructor, and I'm delighted to be reunited. I was delighted to be re reunited with Lynn Facey and started flying training again. With the patience of a saint, Lynn, Lynn spent the better part of 120 hours in the cockpit with me, looking on without me ever going solo. While Mona not only qualified as a private pilot within about 55 hours, she also arranged to f fly a tail dragger, which is a difficult plane to fly, reapply a dancing tech training, gained an instrument rating, a night rating, an aerobatic rating, and not content with that, she decided it would be much more fun to climb several thousand feet and rather than settle there, throw herself out of the plane wearing a parachute. So the research, the dancing, the yoga, the piano, the marquetry, the rock climbing and the painting and the drawing and the calligraphy and the marquetry all seem to be falling out of the sky with her in some weightless version of Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. It seemed to me that while I was gently ambling along in Cartesian space and time, she'd somehow found an additional 10,000 hours to acquire all these skills and publish more than 100 peer-reviewed articles while she was waiting for the next thing that she felt she needed to learn before it would stop being 6 a.m. in Paxatawney and every day would be the 2nd of February. At her annual PDR with her mentor, it's a ritual we go through with our line managers to say what we've done and what we hope to do. Uh, she was asked uh, what she wanted. They, 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 these always close with the one argument, so what's your ambition for the next year to come? And Ruba has it that when she was asked that, she said, Oh, I think I really want to fly a jet fighter. Well, I'm with you there, Mona. It's not only that I'd love to fly a jet fighter, I'd really love to have the enthusiasm to say to my mentor, instead of rack, say that to my mentor, instead of racking my brains, thinking of a smart title and a journal that I could publish it in. So to those of us who've had the privilege of working with her on Zoom, 
we've noticed that after her astrophysics course, her background picture has changed to the International Space Station. I guess her answer this year to the question about her ambition will be to free fall from the ISS and pull the ripcord at the last moment. I suspect that in the next 50 minutes, we may learn what she might be thinking about on the way down as she waits for Earth to rejoin her. Welcome home, Professor Marlowe. <laughs> A lot of things I talk about has been funded by different organizations. I have a big commitment to research integrity and improving quality of research. That's one of my very interests. And some of the organizations I talk about, I have either co-founded or co-founded in there. I have lived in different countries. I lived in Iran. I'm originally Iranian. I lived in Germany and I was now been in the UK. And I have, I'm naming some people that I have met in this journey of, of my scientific career, but it's just a selection of people. There's a lot more people I have worked with, helped me and collaborated with me that had a big influence of my career. Um, so I actually start somewhere a bit unusual uh, for, uh, because some, I looked at some of the other previous lectures and a lot of them were very biographical. So I, I stick to the pattern. And I jokingly tell people that uh, all of the research I do, it started, some of them at least, some of the questions I try to address started when I was like five, six years old. And there's truth to it. And I would actually explain the story behind it, which, much, which sometimes makes much more sense why I do what I do and how I approach things, because I did um, decide to have a bit of an unusual career. So when I was like around um, six, seven years old, I, I, if you ask me what do you want to be as an adult, I would say I want to be a scientist. And, and as you can imagine, the six year old, most of the information you get is from the television. And uh, there was this cartoon there that was showing very famous scientists and implying that all of these scientists, where they were children, they already dreamt about what they want to be in the, when they are adult. Which, as a six-year-old, I totally panicked. I thought, I have to decide now what I want to do as a scientist, otherwise I can never be a scientist. So I came up with this whole list of weird things that I wanted to do because I thought if I don't find a question now, I would not be a scientist because that cartoon said that. But it actually raised an important question that stayed for me up to this day, is that what is a good research question and who decides what's a good research question? I ended up in high school, physics, I do remember um, that I would ask questions and some questions they would uh, cite an experiment and some questions they extrapolate from the result of another experiment. But there was no logic, how do you decide what questions you need actually new studies and what questions you can extrapolate from other studies. And in one of those kind of interactions between me and the teacher, I prided myself that I can answer any math and physics question there was this one question I couldn't answer. I was, I was really stuck. I found out later, I found the answer, but the answer was so simple, I couldn't believe that's the answer. So I ended up doing something really bizarre. I, it was a geometry question. I took some piece of a thread, put it under uh, geometry, and built a three-dimensional um, object and tried to solve the problem in three dimensions and then bring it back. I ended, ended up realizing my first simple answer was the right one, but it kind of made me realize that Looking one way to a question it sometimes misses some of the complexity it has. I learned a lot about that object trying to do that exercise. So forward from high school, I was in the dental school, and this was in Iran years ago. So some of the things I would say, we would not do that in a dental school here. This was a long time ago there. So um, I think a lot of, I, I found dental school really confusing. And the final patient I had, and people who have been my students have heard this story way too many times, was kind of brought together all of the confusion I had about dentistry. So I had this patient, it was my last patient, and I wanted to do the perfect treatment. I was committed, this, would, this patient would go out with the most perfect partial denture that ever somebody seen. I read any possible paper, I find the most critical supervisor to work with, and I have done everything. It looked perfect. And I went to the patient and I, I wanted to test it out. It was uncomfortable. The patient looks at me and says, I'm hating it. I'm not going to wear it. And I was very kind of distraught with all of this work. I went to my supervisor. I said, I don't know what to do. He said, the patient is an idiot. Go and convince him. And I felt this interaction doesn't make any sense in that whole thing. But it kind of, and years afterward, I understood what some of the things that happened is that um, 
those times, evidence-based healthcare and especially evidence-based medicine and dentistry wasn't that um, popular yet. The realization that some of the assumptions we make about our treatment, the qu quality of the evidence is quite limited. And sometimes when the quality of evidence is limited and when you weigh up and down with the patient values, you might want to come up with a different decision than just one standard treatment with them. Looking back, I probably should have given that, um, that patient a lot more options because I was I was saying this is the best treatment because in long term fits with him, but in short term he would have been uncomfortable and he should have had a role in making that decision whether he wants to accept that or not. Then in Iran and dentistry is a doctoral program, so I had to do a dissertation. That was my first doctoral dissertation and um, I thought I would find the answers there. And um, it was a, a micro what I did was I was looking at the antimicrobial activity of some dental materials. So you take a culture, you put the material there, you put the microbes in there, see how many microbes it kills. It seems very simple, very standard test. We did lots of replication. I was trying to write up the dissertation and the discussion. One of the big problems was the material distributed differently in that plate, in the agar, uh, than it would do in the mouth or in the teeth. And the difference was so small, I couldn't... I couldn't find out a way to explain that this what the meaning of the results is if somebody wants to apply it because there's so much difference. And I didn't want to give up, so I went on a search to find one paper that kind of gave me another solution. I found this, this paper in some Brazilian journal. I remember it was a Brazilian dental journal. And they have done a different way of doing it. They have done a different way of testing it. I went to my professor and said, can we replicate some of the experiments with that? And she said, she read that and she said, no. I'm like, why? And she's like, there's not enough details reported that we can replicate it. So there's some idea, but there's not enough. And I finished the dissertation. I could have published it, I could have presented it, but nothing else would happen afterwards. This all seems to be, doesn't seem to be the scientific process I was hoping as a six year old I would experience. And I think the changing moment was for me when I met the Cochrane Collaboration, the people in the Cochrane Collaboration. So the Cochrane Collaboration is an international evidence-based health organization. What they do is systematic reviews. So what is a systematic review? Systematic reviews are, you take one clinical question, you try to identify all of the relevant study designs on that study, appraise them, synthesize them, and answer it. And in all of this step, you have your transparent, your systematic, your critical to achieve it. And, and in, those, in that process, a lot of the discussion that the, in the Cochrane Collaboration was happening answered a lot of my question. Because, for example, we do talk about the problem of reporting, and if it not, there are people who develop reporting guidelines to address that problems. And there is all of these issues that I was struggling with. Suddenly, there was somewhere I might find some answers to it. At that time, these are some of the people I met at the beginning of it. The Cochrane Collaboration was built by, founded by somebody called Sarian Chalmers, it was also shown in the picture. And I have to say, it was also a bizarre time for me because it was like, I was a 20 year old uh, newly graduated dentist student and I had access to this network of international experts who for some reason volunteers to give me time to train me, help me, advise me to do projects. So I ended up doing a lot of more systematic reviews, a lot more work around, um, a lot more work around uh, meta-research, which is like research on research, to understand what is going wrong in the process of doing research that affects the results. I did a lot of systematic reviews in the industry and non industry. One of the most dispersing things you find out when you start doing that is that some of the most important clinical questions we have don't have a lot of evidence behind them. So you end up with saying, the three clinical trials, the quality of these clinical trials are not very good, so we cannot give an answer. And, and it, it, it suddenly made all of those dental problems I had in dental school more apparent because a lot of things that I would thought, what I learned is this treatment works this way, and I was given this impression as a very definite answer, is actually not. There's uncertainty around it. And when there's uncertainty around it, then you know that you have to consider that the balance of the treatment might be different when you're coming and seeing a patient. And what one of the things that also was really interesting I saw is that when you do systematic reviews, it kind of shows you where the gap of research are. So some of this review we did like 10 years ago, when we updated it, suddenly from four clinical trials, we had 30. And it happens in all of the 
fields of healthcare that's similar. People start doing systematic review, it became apparent there's a gap. People start doing research to address those gaps, and suddenly you have evidence to answer them. So, so don't be worried, the industry is improving <laughs> over the years. Uh, one of the interesting things during the years I was done was like, um, I ended up doing some other work in medical history, which uh, it was more focused about um, how the methodology of research has been, how old it is, some of the discussion we have in methodology of research. And the depressing part is, it's actually sometimes older than you think, and you think what, it has been years and years, and still people don't, don't follow certain principles of good research, even after like 100 years of discussion about that this is important. And um, so yeah, so and one of the other things I learned when I was working with Cochrane was you can capitalize on an international network to make your work more influential. And also, it's not only about how do you do research, but also how do you uh, organize the people around you and the groups you build. And that sometimes, especially if you're trying to do large scale research projects with lots of expertise, that's as key as to be an expert about what you're doing and others. Um, so after so one of the key start, key changing of my career was I moved to Germany. I worked in the Institute for Quality and Efficiency in Healthcare, which is a, it's a if people know NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK, it's very similar to that in Germany. And if you wondering, I don't vent every day like that to work uh, in the in Germany in Cologne. Carnival is a big thing. It was a carnival day, I was wearing like that. But the rest of the office did look always like that because we were always having very different reports coming up. So I had to find a classification system, so I would distribute them there. Um, during that time, I was working with somebody called Peter Savicki, and Peter got me into involved in, in, in comparative study between countries. So at that time, Obama was, Obama was president in the US and he had, a lot of people know about the Obamacare. But one of the other things Obama have done, he introduced the Comparative Effectiveness Research Bill. And at that time they were discussing what to do with that bill. And Comparative Effectiveness Research is a different way talking about systematic reviews and clinical trials, really. Um, and he, and there was a lot of consultation going on how to inform that bill and the implementation of the bill. One of the projects that was commissioned was a project commissioned by the Commonwealth Fund to compare the evidence-based policy-making process between Germany, UK, France and Australia. And ICWIC was the organization from Germany involved and I was been, Peter asked me to write the German report with him. So I ended up writing the evidence-based policy-making uh, report for Germany and then working with the four countries to compare the process between them. I have to say, I'm generally a very confident speaker, so I don't mind, I, can, I have been going to talks even not prepared. The only time in my life I ever was totally terrified giving a presentation was the last workshop of this project. Because the last workshop was a project with, you yeah, had the chair of NICE there, the economic advisor of the US Congress, and a week before my boss told me, you're going alone for that. And I was like, I'm hoping nobody asked me difficult questions. So, but that was a very important project. And one of the things I learned a lot from that was about, despite the different contextual, fact, contextual factors that affect how evidence-based policy making works in different countries, which are legal, political, social acceptance, structure, academic um, expertise available, there are some similar, themes in there. And one of the important ones is early stakeholder engagement is important. Uh, you need to understand what has policy acceptance at before you, when you start you doing the work to get some buy-in from people before you do. And also the importance to demonstrate commitment to high quality research. Um, and the reason I'm telling you is I come back to it in a few years that these principles become very important for the project I'm doing to be able to implement it properly. So during the time when I worked in, as a clinician, I worked as a researcher, I worked in the Policy Institute, the common theme I saw was that there are important questions that has been around for 10, 20 years in the clinic and policy making, but we still don't have enough research to answer them. And some of them are really important questions and I didn't understand why. Why would not anybody pick up and answer them? One of my pet hate things was 
Sometimes people have done research, but the research is slightly off, like slightly not complete, doesn't address all of the things that it needs to inform a policy. And if somebody of the researchers ever talked to somebody of the policymakers, they would have known and it's an easy fix to do it, but it would make a huge difference in implementing it. So I ended up working with a lot of people saying, and this is the time I just moved to the UK. So I was here in Plymouth, and at that time, Liz Kay was the dean, and uh, David Mills, my boss, was the director of postgraduate, postgraduate educational research. And they have given me some freedom of trying to shape research work. And I said, I want to work around what the methods of research part setting are. And at that time, there were some publications. A lot of them were like national level publication, like the um, Council of Health Research Development running part setting in like countries around the world, in low income countries. Um, but there was not, there was, the interesting was that there was a lot of suggestion how to do prior setting, some of them really complex methods, but there was very little evidence to support that those methodologies are good methodologies or not at work. The first thing we started to do is decide, okay, how do you define a good prior setting process and what does success mean in that process? So we ended up doing an evaluation framework. I have to say, the time I have been doing this work, uh, somebody else started doing this work, and at those days, it was not very common to pre-register your, some of your meta studies beforehand. And this is one of the things I learned over the years. If you have a good idea, it's very likely the conditions that made you have a good idea, somebody else has that same idea. And um, funny enough, the two of us ended up in a conference sitting beside each other very accidentally and looking at each other and saying, you're the one who published that paper. <laughs> Um, so we ended up doing evaluation frameworks around it, and, um, and as you see, we also ended up developing a reporting guideline because you remember the story about the microbes. I, I didn't want people to try to publish things in a way that nobody can replicate it, so we thought reporting guidelines can help with that. Um, so we started doing a series of work and then started to build the part setting methods group. There were a lot of people involved in building that methods group, but Sally was probably the person who worked most closely with me to build. Sally Corbett, at that time, was working with the James Lind Alliance. It's a beautiful initiative, if you ever want to look at it. It's, a, it's an initiative focused on bringing patient and clinician together to make their priorities more clear. So because they, the argument is, researchers already control research priorities. Let's see what the priorities of the clinicians and the patients are. And Sally was a big champion at that time. Uh, doing a lot of the works of bringing the patient and clinicians together and do a part setting. They work together to build the methods group, which is still running, and we still do methods research in that field. Um, and recently we actually updated the, for, um, the, um, the framework we built to build something bigger around that. Um, and a lot of the work we did at the own part setting ended up into WHO guidelines and ended up informing other people's priority setting, become a, hand, become a book chapter and other guidelines of people doing research. Um, the, one of the big questions that came up as part of the process is how do you engage with more a diverse population? Because one of the big problems is we usually have like people like us being in a room deciding what the research priorities is, which we don't always know what the priorities of people are for different ethnicities, different socioeconomic stages, different abilities, and how to bring that diversity in. And I have actually two PhD students who are actually in the room who are working on it, and I will let them, when they have an inaugural talk, tell you more about how we can achieve that, because some of their work in Malaysia uh, has been very uh, helpful in kind of unpacking those issues in that. So um, at that time, at, at this stage, when we had the metrics group, we have done some work around it. A paper was published by one of my mentors in Chalmers and Paul Glasio, around 85% of research is wasted. It's an estimation, and um, it tries to, it, it estimated by the fact of how, many, how much research is low quality, how much research never gets reported, never gets published, how many research never gets published fully. It's a valuable paper to read. Uh, but one of the things the group after the paper was published was to build an international collaboration that different people started working on different aspects of the research base and what it, uh, what it looked into. And at that time, I was at the stage in my work about party setting that I realized one of the biggest influence about research party setting are organizations like funders. The funders are an interesting one because 
not only the people who get funding from them are influenced by them, even people who are not getting funding. Because all of us, we want to get research funding. So we try to do research that aligns with them, so increase our chances to getting it, or write proposals around it. So we end up working on that area, even if we never get the funding. So funders have a big influence both to the people who they fund, but also other people who want their funding. So I ended up working with research funders on seeing how they, what are they doing and how they might contribute, not contribute to research base. It's probably the one paper I have published that had the most social media attention ever and debate online. And um, it, partially it was, it had a table like this kind of grading funders as red, green or orange, um, yellow, based on the quality of their work. And you might think, I might have got into a lot of trouble publishing that. But, but that's the reason I could help you when I was talking about the project I did in Germany for the comparative effectiveness research one. I learned how to deal with policymakers at that time. So one of the things I did, I have early engaged with the funders. So they knew already this data is there, this is happening, if they want to respond to it, react to it, prepare for it. I and mean, even before we published to Lancet, they were all informed of it. I got zero backlash from this paper. And not only I got zero backlash, in one of the conferences I was sitting and presenting, Barbara came to me, she is, uh, she's a director in the Dutch funder Zone MW. And she came to me and said, I saw your presentation, can we do something to fix it? That was technically this, uh, what did she said. At that time, Matt Westermore was a director in NIHR, the National Institute of Health Research, which is the main applied health research funder in the UK. So I don't take credit to whatever happened, all of it, because there were a lot of other people and other things driving this. But one of the things that happened, there was a funders forum there was, that got together. Uh, it's called Ensuring Value for in Research, the Every Funders Forum. And um, they got, there's a, lots of international funders from UK, um, Germany, Netherlands, uh, North America, that got together and they have like guiding principles which also map to the different pillars of the reduced research-based um, framework and trying to find ways to improve the processes they have. During this conversation, one of the things became very clear was that one of the ways you could reduce research base is having using more systematic reviews before you do new research, because you're a very powerful tool to show your, bring all of the research together systematically and showing you where the real gap is. But sometimes it can be very complicated to do this process. So we ended up doing building another initiative called the Evidence-Based Research Network, and we had some funding from the um, EU um, Cost Action to kind of work on it further, and we have written a lot of work and have done work around how do you use systematic reviews to inform future research and what are the different ways and methodologies you can use. And it's an ongoing project that we are still going on. Uh, our idea is that we're hoping it becomes such a popular culture someday that the organization is not needed, but until then we keep the collaboration going. So, I talked a lot about we should do part setting, we should do systematic reviews, and then should do research. I thought, okay, I should actually do that myself. So I, especially at that time, I was working with David Moles here in, the, in Plymouth. So we tried to be a bit more um, loyal to this principle. So we would take part setting question, we would take question from stakeholders and try to prioritize it. One of the interesting things you would see over time that there is a lot of overlap what people have interested in, where the biggest problems are. So we find it to have see patterns of research emerging from it. And the photos I have is like one of my previous and two of my current PhD students who are working on these areas. And, um, and hopefully one day they become professors and kind of explain how they went to it. And the green ones are the active projects. I talked a lot about my past project, I thought I'd talk about some of our current projects going on that builds on it. So one of them is um, a project actually I've worked together with Michael Pont who was introducing me just now and is looking at um, nonverbal tales of anxiety. It came up, there were different streams of conversation that led to this project. One was that um, we have seen in a lot of conversation that sometimes the dentist is as scared as the patient. I mean, maybe we shouldn't consider the whole anxiety of the dental practice in a kind of dynamic way between them rather than separate. We saw that a lot of 
young dentists sometimes struggle with a new patient, how to deal with them, how, what are the things that are happening in the practice. And we wanted to use a different methodology to try to address that problem by uh, working together with filmmakers and uh, addressing it. And I think that's important because uh, you remember I told you the geometric question of doing the threads. Sometimes I feel like if you always try to solve the problem in the same way and if, if you're spending 10 years doing research and you still don't have an answer, you might want to explore a different methodology from a different discipline to address it, which is what we are trying to do here. As part of it, we started to work with some of the, I said, I, I always do stakeholder engagement with different stakeholder engagement. This is a drawing from one of the children and one of this engagement we did. Apparently in a dental practice, the most important thing is an aquarium for him. Uh, but during this process, when we were preparing, um, some of my colleagues came to me who worked social robotics and said, can we have social robotic in dental practice? And I thought, that's a dumb idea. Sorry, sorry I'm saying it loudly, but yeah, that was my first thought. But then I thought, okay, I'm doing it systematically. So I said, we're doing this part setting, bring the social robot there and see what happens. I was amazed because I was watching the children to interact. Children liked robots, that was obvious. But the thing that was really struck me was the children were more honest to the robot than us. So if you ask the same question from the robot, we could get a better <laughs> answer than us. And I thought, okay, that is something to explore. There is something in there. So we ended up doing a collaboration. Uh, but we ended up realizing that the way we want to set up the robots in a dental practice, we have to be sure that because these are children, it's important that their privacy is secured, that we have to look at the cybersecurity platforms work smoothly before we try to test it. The high one who is there is kind of leading that work around building the cybersecurity platforms. Um, as, you, as I mentioned also, I worked a lot in decision-making in healthcare because I'm still upset about that one patient. I, my, uh, my, um, uh, my supervisor when I was younger told me it didn't make any sense what happened in there. Uh, so one of the problems that happened in that scenario I told you about the patient I had in the dental school was there was uncertainty about the information. So there was ideas about if we do this, this might work. But it wasn't like all of the studies repeatedly show that this is works. It's sometimes, it seems to work sometimes in some cases. That's usually how research results look like. But the problem is we don't usually tell people that because people like to have a black and white answer. They don't want to say, this maybe sometimes works, this probably works 60%. They like to know, does this treatment work or not? So Prashanti actually was working on how people perceive uncertainty, how they manage it, and how we should maybe deal with that when we make decision making, rather than assuming all of us have the same view about how to deal with uncertainty. I also work with some people in Philippines around how health decision might be much more complicated when you're dealing with a, a disaster and a healthcare system problem altogether and how it influences the processes. Uh, that was the photo you saw at the beginning of the dissertation. So I started to, I confess, I, when I started to work with the European Space Agency, it was supposed to be just a few fun projects. I was advising to help them to do some systematic reviews around rehabilitation of astronauts. But then Anna Falkman came to me and said, she had this question coming one of the astronauts about how impact of ionizing radiation and the sex differences around it and the implication that we had in long-term trips of which astronauts would go on the long-term trip or not. So we ended up making a team to build up a big systematic review. It's a huge systematic review with thousands, 50,000 results. We have a machine learning team, a crowdsourcing team to work on it together. And actually, if you want to be involved, we have to have several cultures and campaigns. So you could also sometimes engage in that project. So, and during this project, we also realized that there is the actually dentistry has not done a lot of work in there. So we are doing some testing in a caving analog mission. Analog missions are field tests they do on Earth before they do send something in the space exploration. We are doing one in Azores to do to test some new methodologies that we might be suggesting if it works to use it for future, um, as an experiment for a future space mission. Um, there was a project that uh, Michael talked about at the beginning, the Cognova project. I wanted to touch on it because it, had a, it taught me something very different from a lot of other work they do, I do. A lot of work I do, I'm looking at the past. I'm looking at where the research gaps are, what is it we always do, we don't have evidence around it, and all of it. It just looks into the future or about how 
if we change how our traditional way of thinking works, how research would be different. And I actually learned it from a mutual PhD student we had, which was Aggie Haynes. Her PhD is a lot wider than that, and I'm not going to say what the, her, explain her whole PhD. But one thing I learned from Aggie was, if, my, if I understand the human body in a different way, or what I think is acceptable or where the borders are, I would ask different research questions. That was a fundamental thing for me, was kind of changed how I looked at research priorities, research question. As part of Cognovi, we run this off the lip conference, and one of them was in 2020 in um, Philippines. And I have to say, it was just before the COVID pandemic hit. Like, it was a big trip, and we came back, and the pandemic started. And we had these different groups we were working on, around, mapped around the sustainable development goals. And one of the groups I was running was the reimagining of sustainability. What this group did, which I thought was really fascinating, was the group tried to rewrite an environmental policy for a rural island in Philippines in 100 years in the future, with the concept of a word in th that's, that doesn't have a translation in English, it's called kapwa, which kind of implies something as part of me is in you. So different languages or different cultures have different perception of individuality and collectiveness, and that can totally change how you perceive things around you. So, and what happened in that work is that they demonstrated how a different conceptual or cultural aspect can change how we see a concept like sustainability in the future. Which ended up, I, I do, um, Michael ended up, I do a lot of, I have a lot of extracurricular activity. And um, so I do a lot of visual art. And what I ended up doing something that um, ended up to be a lot, I ended up publishing it off, I just did it for fun. It was to get people together to reimagine the future. If we did it for climate change, for clinical research, to give you an example, I would get a group of people together. We imagine we're on Mars, but we would um, try to design the research responding to an epidemic at the same time of managing that epidemic. And I have to say, when I run that workshop, COVID didn't happen. And I do find it very terrifying, the similarity of some of the conversation that happened when COVID happened. But uh, it was... It started with this idea, I was a bit annoyed that some of the science fiction about clinical research were not reflecting how we progress about clinical research. So we call this workshop Metafuturism. It happens a few, every other day. So if you wanted to participate in one, uh, if you had one open one, feel free to join. They're fun, but it also kind of trains you to think about alternative future rather than just thinking about the past when you think about research. So before I... Uh, so at the moment, I'm now the director of Plymouth Institute of Health and Care Research from July. I have to say, I find it very exciting and also terrifying because up to now, I talked a lot about process, price setting, and so on. And now I'm in charge. I have a decision-making role that I can influence these processes. I have no excuse left that I cannot do these things now, which puts me in a diff different position now, moving from theories to something that's actually implementable. Uh, before I finish, I do want to mention one person more. As, uh, Gordon Guyatt is one of the founders of ABM. He's a professor in McMaster. And um, years ago, this was like 12 years ago, he, uh, I was in a meeting. I raised an opinion about something. It was a very dense, a very complicated meeting. And he, um, I raised an opinion, and I wasn't sure whether the room took it well. It, to be honest, I know I'm saying it was more than 12. It was like 15, 16 years ago. I wasn't sure whether it went well. And my colleague told me I was very rude. Why would I raise up and challenge some, some of the biggest experts in the field in that? And because I was a stubborn person, I didn't give up because I did want to know what I'm wrong. So I emailed Gordon again in a very apologetic email. It started with, I'm really, really sorry I'm sending this email. Made my point and I apologized again. He came back and emailed me saying, Mona, I have a lot of respect for you as a scientist. Your research is valuable. Please don't apologize and do raise your opinion. So from that day, every time I have an opinion, I do raise in the meeting. So if you're in a meeting with me and you're really upset that I talk a lot, you know who to blame now. <laughs> so, so I'm finishing off by saying one of the things I learned, asking a good research question is a skill that needs to be refined. Systematic reviews are not only important to inform policy and practice, they can structure your future research. Meta-research studies are very valuable to understand the biases happen because you want to know what, it, what you find is what you're actually looking for, not the artifact of your process. And 
if you want to have impactful research, early engagement with stakeholders is important, but also thinking innovatively how to partner and engage with them, rather than taking a very simple tokenistic approach. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you have. Hi, Mona. Thank you so much for that. Um, I know you mentioned uh, later on in the talk about the impact that um, different cultures and how they, you know, view even communities and how they interact impacts the questions that they ask and the type of research that's done. When you're doing a systematic review, does it take that into consideration? Because I know I come from a very small island. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, and one of the things that we don't do a lot of there is research for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our influences then will come from US or UK or wherever the case may be. So I know that that's, that happens in a lot of smaller places, different cultures. So when you're doing systematic research to inform policy for like World Health Organization that might be doing a policy for these same countries that may not be doing that level of input, how do you take that into consideration? Yeah. Okay, there, there, it's a very good question and it's a very complex answer because it has lots of layers to it. Because, um, first of all, a systematic review is as good as the studies out there. We call it the expression garbage in, garbage out. So you could run a very perfect systematic review. If you have really bad studies out there, you cannot do anything. However, I think there is a, there are two or three angles you can take. One is what is the research question you ask? One of the things I find with parity is that there are two, two ways people are different with different groups. Sometimes they have different questions to ask, but sometimes they have the same question, how much value and what aspect of the question they value is different. To give an example, there was a thing in the Cochrane Library years ago. I think this review doesn't exist anymore. It was, uh, it was well, some of the Chinese authors have written the Cochrane Review. Now it, the Cochrane Reviews are a bit more like uh, standardized, but the, the Chinese group, what they did, they had this outcome measure, and one of the outcome measures was how quickly you can get home from the hospital. And they made this whole argument that like, like this review was done in other settings and this was, wasn't the primary outcome measure because they're more more clinical one, it was about a heart disease. But for Chinese families, it's very important they don't want the, child, the family to be in the hospital. They want to be as soon as home, even if it means that some of the other outcome measures are a bit compromised, they're weighing up and down. And I thought that was a really interesting demonstration of an argument. But what it demonstrates is sometimes when the issue is about priorities of what you value, the first thing is people have measured it, which would be nice. But if they don't measure it, you cannot do it. But if they measure it and they have resolved, then the issue is you might have the same data set, but you might have different recommendation for different contexts based on the priorities. Like the example I gave you with the patient at the beginning I had, the denture, partial denture one. That pa in one patient, it would have been more very appropriate to give the denture I have given him. Because the denture I given him was built with the idea how much I can preserve his born long term because he would long term be a be it would be better care for him. But imagine the same patient is a cancer patient who might die in three months, giving him a very uncomfortable <coughs> denture in that, la that to increase his lasting for long term, uh, and but they make him uncomfortable. It's totally nonsense. It doesn't make sense. You would make something that might damage long term the bone, but the person has a very short lifespan, so it doesn't make sense to do that up and up. So at least like, you want to give the option to the patient to decide whether they want to do that up and down. So, so there is an issue about what, what we measure, how we value those measurements, and how we prioritize, and when we have the data, how we weigh up and down when we are implementing it to go. I have actually a funny anecdote about that. I was with a friend um, who, is, uh, who was working NICE at that time. I was working ICFIC, she was working NICE. And we were in the, in the bar uh, um, drinking, and we, her husband was there, who was a, um, um, a physicist working with CERN. So, and we were talking about how so the HPV vaccine has a similar set of data. There are some big clinical trials. So every country has the same data set they're using to make recommendations. But every European country has a different recommendation whether they give the HPV vaccine or not. And we were discussing it. And just to explain, it is appropriate that they have different recommendations. Different countries have different legal system, political system, value system. Sometimes it's very reasonable they have different decisions in the same data set. And her husband listened, listened. At some stage, he got really upset. He said, 
what you guys doing is not science. How can you have the same data set and have different results? But I think the thing he didn't understood is we have a uh, we have one result from the data set. How we contextualize that result for different contexts was different. So the policy decision was different. The scientific decision was the scientific data wasn't different. But it, it was really funny seeing him getting really angry with us because he sat here for one hour and he couldn't understand how is that science when we are coming with different recommendations. And so on. does that answer the question in some ways? <laughs> Hi, yes, uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, I wanted to talk about the decision making um, with the patients that you were talking about earlier, where um, uh, that's, I'm seeing a trend in research where patient-centered care and person-centered care decision making is um, becoming a lot more popular, but the focus is very much on um, self-management and self-care at home, which um, to me kind of comes across as um, relying too much on the patient to be involved in their healthcare, And I was wondering if you had a perspective on that. Um, that's a, uh, OK. So patient, because patients under care, the expression of it can mean a lot of things. So I always find it difficult when people use that expression, what angle of it, because it can range from people talking about shared decision making to talking about like self-management issues to talking about selecting patient outcome measures to research. Um, I think the issue, I think the, that's, it's an interesting question. I think there are two aspects of it. One aspect is when we do part station of research, and a lot of things what we see is sometimes people say they don't want to have more drugs. They want to have, know how to manage it themselves. That comes up, uh, I'm not saying one part setting exercise specific, but you, you see a theme coming up in different questions that people want to know what they self-manage because they don't like the idea to, to have to go to the doctor and so on. But um, so, so that has been seen in that discussion of it. I think the issue that you're raising is that that if that becomes the more predominant only option available or only part of the discussion, it might look like it's victim blaming rather than addressing the health services issues. Uh, but that also, but I think the reason that that looks like that is a problem is because it comes along across with the same time that people have difficulties with accessing clinicians and it's given as a substitute rather than as a complementary things. So I think the difference, is, the difference here is about the perception of what's happening in the health services at the moment and how people perceive this intervention is being put forward as a priority rather than as being a possible potential research question that we need to ask. Um, so, that, so, so yeah, it's, it has this, this complex layer of it. But I would say self-management is something that comes up of something the patient wants. But I think, depending on the, uh, the situation of the health services context, how it's accepted or viewed might be different because of what's happening at that time in that context. That seems to me, the, that's, that, that would be how I see it. Um, does that answer the question in some ways? Yeah. Yeah, I was going, yeah. Yeah. But I think maybe actually another way, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to think as I'm answering you, but I think it's, Another way of kind of thinking about the problem is the difference between thinking about self-management as an intervention versus self-management as part of the health services, because that's a different conversation than this one. And when you become, when you telling health self-management as a separate intervention, then it makes sense to compare it to others and so on. But it becomes part of the health services. It depends on how people perceive it was presented to them. So that's kind of the, where the difference comes from. So, yeah. The question here says, in modern research, only positive outcomes are discussed. What are experts doing to publish more papers that are not the outcomes that are desired? Thank you. Um, OK, that's uh, what, what for, for, the, for people who might, some of you might already be familiar with the term of publication bias or reporting bias. It's a known factor in research that people who have if po positive results are more likely to be published than negative results. It's not only more likely to be published, they're more likely to be quicker published, more likely to publish in English, more likely to publish in famous journals. And I'm, I'm smiling because I'm supposed to give a presentation on publication bias on Friday, so I was reading about it. And one of the sad parts is it has, it has been known in the, in the field for a long time. One of the things that happened in the last um, I, I, I cannot say in my head, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but it start, we, we started to do methodological research on it. So we like, there are people who actually compare that they look, find all of the research that has been sent to ethics and then follow it up how many are published or not published, or if, or if, they, if they are published, what outcome measures they reported. And they saw, they saw that uh, positive studies are more likely to be published and um, 
the outcomes measurements that are more positive are more likely to be mentioned in the paper. So the way people have tried to address it, one is, is to in introduce registration of studies. It has been with clinical trials. Now, now, it's very less, uh, the, now it's not very likely you can get a clinical trial done and published if you don't have a pre-registration of it. The idea was to reduce the amount of uh, people doing research and then not publish it or not being aware of it that published. But in reality, it didn't totally fix the problem because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of resources available to monitor what people put there because people put in there and don't give you enough details so they can still change it, change things afterwards. Nowadays, it's becoming even more popular that people actually publish the protocol, like an article, and then do the main research of it. It becomes common practice in universities to do that. And that has been very useful because then you can compare the details and see what changes happen between them. And you want to preferably people doing uh, reporting it. My personal perspective is that actually the way it has, the best way to change it is that the places that people do research, which is university, academic institution, to change the culture and the infrastructure to build it. Because we are all, it's very difficult to do things. We, we, academic work is very busy. You have to do teaching, administration, research. And it's much easier to do things if it becomes like a pipeline process. So everybody knows that if they want to publish the protocol, this is the place you publish. This is the step to doing it and become something that everybody does. And so I think it's, it's a, there's a lot of intervention people can do, but there's also a lot of um, culture change you have to do. However, there is a third problem that I don't address because partially I'm not a big expert on it, which is the pharma industry and how the publication wise works in there because there are other issues coming up in that one. And I, I, would, be, I would be lying if I say I'm up to date about how some of the intervention happened in there, how it's going on. Because I remember there was this issue around that like FDA wouldn't approve a drug if the clinical trial wasn't registered, but if they had the clinical trial to present that wasn't registered, the fine was something like $100,000 for, for a multi-million business, that's nothing. So, but I don't know if this, this has changed. I remember this was like years ago when I was looking into it, but I don't, I wouldn't be totally up to date about the issue what's happening before my industry now. So let's come. Um, does that answer the question, Zoska? There's uh, no feedback on that, but it sort of follows on from that in a way that there's a question here congratulating you on your professorship, of course. Um, and really it concerns the role of AI in uh, misinformation and misinformation in the future research outcomes and how they're interpreted. Have you had any thoughts on that? This is such a big question. It's so, uh, there are so many angles of this question that can be answered. Uh, uh, actually, I, I choose one of the angles to answer, so I have something to focus on. Because I think, let's think about ChatGPT, because people use ChatGPT as health information and so on. And I have tested it, I tried to do it. It's a very useful tool, it transferring information together and gives you a summary of what's happening in there. One of the things I have repeatedly said in this, in this type of um, like technologies, it does, the thing that we have, we do very well in systematic reviews is not only finding all of the studies, it's critically appraising it, doing a risk of bias, what other type of quality assessment to see what's the quality of the data that we are synthesizing before we make a conclusion. And that's a very critical part, at least my favorite part. And all of these kind of, most of these technologies that, at least to my knowledge, and I'm not an AI expert, uh, seems to be processing knowledge, but they don't have, a, they don't been very good in, disintegrating all of the quality issues underneath it to bring it together. And how we use AI machine learning is as a way of reducing the workload we have to do of the manual work that can be done by AI. So if you have more time to do the critical appraisal ourselves for the synthesis of it. So that would be, that's a very specific angle of AI because AI can be a lot of angles of looking at misinformation. But I thought, I'd, but if it's if another angle, I'm happy to answer. Um, fed about that. The framing of that question was, um, I don't know whether this uh, helps you develop it, is that you've mentioned that people like black and white outcomes. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, it, the, the question is intrigued to know. Okay. So that's actually an interesting point because I think this is, this is an interesting one because when I worked in Germany, we, we produced health information, evidence-based health information for the public. If we had a, and we had, if we had resources. It was a well-funded department we had. I was a methodologist. We had another one. We had a, we had a search information specialist. We had writers. The problem was to make the 
articles in evidence based, but also interesting for people because we ended up with sentences saying, this probably maybe sometimes work, this probably maybe sometimes doesn't work. And the reason, and when we did focus group, people didn't like that. They wanted to know, does it work or does it not work? And, and, and the, the big discussion we had is about how do we, how do we train or how do we do this that people actually understand that there's uncertainty about it? My personal perception, and it might be, and I know some of the people who work, I work with also think the same, is the problem goes back to high school because you go in high school, you have you learn that uh, for a question is one answer. Uh, and if each, any of you have read like, um, no, but like physics questions, most of the questions, they jokingly said, high school, a physics professor cannot answer a high school question because the, the high school question is though it's, in, it reduces all of the details that is needed to make a decision because they know that high school students only knows one answer anyway. Um, and actually there was there are some group in Norway who worked on uh, trying to teach children evidence-based healthcare by trying to teach them these issues about evidence, uncertainty, kind of how things change over the time. And um, so yeah, so, so, so my personal perception is the very best way we can address it, we have to change how we teach children in schools. Because that's where the problem, because what we are doing in the university, we're trying to retrain them what they learn in school. But this is not how to look at information. It's not black and white. And then it brings on the other issues and problems that comes with it. So. so. So flowing from that, really, there's two questions here that we can put together. Um, both send, of course, their thanks for your presentation. Um, one is about shaping research. They're both about shaping researchers of tomorrow. Yeah. And one is as what's the most important tools that young researchers can gain for mm. future quality research, and um, uh, what's your advice for young people who are really confused on how to start their journey? Um, so, okay, the first question was what tools is best for. So the first question was one of the most important tools that young researchers can gain for the future quality of research. Uh -huh. Um, oh yeah, no, I think I think um, when younger says, I think for me, this is my this is my view, and this is probably how I started. Because I think one of the biggest things that helped my career is I started with systematic review rather than starting with doing primary research, because I spent my time appraising other people's research before I did my own research. So that was very helpful for me to understand when somebody wants to read my paper and use it. What are the issues? So when I'm designing the study to consider that. So I my, I think. One of the, I think, biggest tool to, to is starting with thinking about quality of research, understanding how the critical appraisal tools work, and lots of methodological training. So as much as op taking opportunities to do methodology training before and by, uh, trying to do your own research. I have seen people doing, starting, having very limited training, going into trying to do a big project and getting stuck with problems in there. And, and also one of the other things I would say is that being open to the fact that sometimes the methodology to answer your question might sit in another field or another discipline, and you might want to talk to other people in other departments to figure that out. About the wrong researchers confused. Uh, that's the reason I told my story, because I was the wrong researchers very confused at the beginning how to find a journey. Um, so, um, so I think have, I think one of the first things is probably Having the curiosity and having some level of curiosity and interest in the work that's important, because that encourages people to work with you. Um, kind of finding organizations like Cochrane or Campbell that have this kind of public engagement part that they kind of train people to do research before they gain wage. That could be one other way of engaging with them. And for young researchers who already started a career, I would say one of the most helpful thing is finding good mentors. Because um, that would a good mentor can make a whole difference in about how they shape your career afterwards, and uh, and at the moment you're living at least in the healthcare research living in a world that there is a much more diverse range people from diverse backgrounds who are who are quite senior academics now around you that you could tap into, which is much, much helpful because somebody who went through the same problems you have is much easier to, help, to walk you through things that people do, don't understand your experiences in working in that environment. So I would say lots of methodology training, reading papers and critical appraising them, 
and finding good mentors and actually reading papers. I think people at the beginning read a lot of papers. At some stage, we don't read papers anymore. To read papers, that's always important. So, so, so to extend their question, I just wonder if you have any thoughts you'd like to share about interdisciplinary collaborations for early career researchers? Um, so interdisciplinary collaboration is interesting. I think there's a lot, for me, I learned a lot from, I saw a lot of overlap between my attempts to do stakeholder engagement, interdisciplinary engagement, because a lot of it is about understanding people different languages. I think one of the fundamental things is to realize that we are all at the same page, we are on the same level. So it's not somebody training the other person. We are trying to find a mutual understanding on the topic. I think that's a very important starting point of the conversation. The second starting point is uh, recognizing even if you use the same words, they don't mean the same things. So kind of clarifying and discussing it is important. People sometimes want to jump into the interesting part right before they do the preparation and kind of thinking about like, a word review might, or the word quality might mean two different things in two different disciplines. And that would be like, I would say, as a starting point of it. When you get into a collaboration more intensively, I think recognizing where um, the, so every, every, uh, every field has a different level of what is good quality, what's adequate quality, and what is acceptable practices in there. And that's where the tension sometimes comes from because people get really upset about something not done in a certain way because in that field, that's where the problem, that's what they need. And seeing where, and it doesn't always require compromises, kind of <coughs> recognizing how to work together to make it happen, where to, where to find innovative way you can collaborate, or sometimes doing a project from different angles, like. I did my geometry problem, looking at the different angle, from a different angle of it, and trying to solve that problem. So that would be how I would, um, how I would kind of think that maybe it's to be a maybe one way of approaching, or at least starting to approaching it. Yeah. So we have a question here. Can you just wait for the microphone, please. Yeah. Um, this is most interesting, but I'm a different sort of scientist, yeah. and um, working with hard science where you know the facts and things, you're trying to uh, get um, a study across to the general public. Their acceptance can be so, um, it, their preconceptions, their understanding of risk assessments and the like, voluntary and involuntary risk uh, acceptance for them. It, can be also very complicated. And now that you've got social um, media really playing a, a major part in influencing how people think about it, um, how do you, I mean, I can understand um, how you are talking so well with a range of um, uh, researchers and their backgrounds and interacting with that. and coming to really good conclusions on that. But when you start going into the general public, how do you get this across? Because it must be so complicated now. I think one of the, so there, are, um, there are different ways of approaching it. I think one of the people I mentioned before was Sally Crow. She was, uh, uh, Sally probably taught me most about how patient involvement, because that's her main work. She's not an academic. She, her background is how to engage with patients and bring it together. I think, um, and it's a very difficult answer, question to answer because it can range from vaccine conversation, which are very difficult. And I have to say, sometimes I'm like, I cannot do this, to conversations that are much more like small, small scale, like do we should be hand washed or not, which has a big, big acceptance of it. I think one of the things I find is understanding where the fears and the anxiety of the people come from at the beginning, it helps. At least in smaller conversation I had, because that's usually, uh, sometimes it makes you understand that the reason the people are doing something is not what you think is the reason they are. So, like we are trying to educate them about something, but that's not the reason they are doing things. Giving an example, I, I, had, I was working with people who used a lot of alternative medicine, it was, and my assumption was they don't understand alternative medicine doesn't work for this treatment. So I was trying to give information, this is not it works. But I, then I thought, sit down and thought, let's sit down and just talk and let's, let me listen. And I realized 
what they wanted was the human contact. The, pe the people had some loss in their life, they had a difficult time, and these people give them an explanation, an answer, because we, I, it, was a, it was a chronic disease that didn't have a treatment. The contact, that simplicity, that niceness, that was what they were looking at. And I was trying to argue a case about the effectiveness of intervention when that's not what they were looking That was not the reason to doing it. So I think my perception is sometimes understanding people's fears and anxiety and where it comes from, and sometimes recognizing what they value is different from what we value is a starting point to find some commonality in the conversation. However, it's very easy for me to say that here, but in practice, I don't. I, I would never say that I'm always successful. There have been occasions that things were very difficult, and I managed to get people together, and there were occasions that I didn't. And and actually, one of the ones that I found really difficult is the vaccine autism conversation. Is that I I I don't know how to, I don't know how to manage that. If a patient group comes to me, I don't know how to manage it. I find it really difficult because the way of the information has developed and evolved. And the fears and anxiety is in a way, I'm not the, I don't have the skills how to manage it. So I'm quite aware of it. And I think sometimes it's also being aware where your limits are about what to engage with which patient groups rather than trying to force your, your views on it or trying to promise you can deliver that in that sense. But, but yeah, I would say my main thing is looking at fears and anxiety of the people and how to address it. I don't know if it does answer your question or not because I don't know which hard sciences you're coming from. So I'm trying to make guesses about it. So yeah. Let's go. Um, uh, I think we only have a minute left, and I'm really afraid to ask this question. It came, comes in here, and I have to. So, what next? Only a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. I think I, I did describe some of the projects I have currently up. Uh, for me, um, so one of the things one of the things I learned from somebody who's one of my mentors years ago is that. Um, Sometimes some research areas are too crowded, and there's too many people, too many, there are too many brain and resources going in. Do, I, do they need additionally my brain in it? So that's one of the things that I always look at is that I do a project, but then think like, does my brain and resources still need it or not? So I've started a part setting methods group. I don't think my brain is needed for doing a talk about evaluation of part setting, because there's lots of people are doing it. There's a specific area that we're looking at, which is around a very diverse group to bring in together. But the other area that I think at the moment I'm working a lot, which is especially with the Space Medicine project came up, is the issue about the quality of in vitro research. In vitro, for people who don't know, is lab research, like research on cells or on um, <coughs> material in the lab, which is before doing animal research and before clinical research, to looking at the quality of in vitro and um, animal research and how the translation works and how the part setting work. And also a totally different area of work that me and Michael are working on around. Um, um, I, I don't know whether we have a good name. I, I, have to find, I think the best name I've seen was about the idea of effective technologies in healthcare, like bringing in understanding that there is the, the haptic or effective um, um, connection that we have in the practice in the clinical care is a much more important um, factor in some of defining how the clinical care goes and how it influences the dynamic and interaction of it. But finding better ways of studying it that unravels the complexity of it, which we currently don't do. So I would say that would be what's next in the future. Uh, I'm so <laughs> happy it's going to take place on Earth this time. Thank you very much, Mona, <laughs> Professor Mona Nasser, for your lecture and your answering questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.